All right, good morning, everybody. I'll go ahead and get this started. I just hit the record button, so you probably got the warning to approve it. Um, so I will, as usual, send this out afterwards. Uh, today, we have John and Bob from Netterman. They are the regional sales managers um, for all of Veritech and um, Norman S. Wright Climate Tech in San Diego. So uh, as always, go ahead and put your questions in the chat throughout and then we'll hit them at the end. And uh, John, I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, Ms. Katie, or Kelly, I'm sorry. Um, welcome everybody. I noticed we have a very, very large group attending today. And, and although the header says Vehicle Design 101, we're gonna dive into it a little bit deeper. Um, Bob's on the West Coast, I'm still in Texas, thank goodness. and. If, if it seems a little redundant or something, raise a question, raise your hand for the for the follow up on the back side to, to propose some questions. Now, what we're going to basically talk about in this is system design, system engineering, duck style, duck sizing, and Netterman's approach to vehicle exhaust system design. We approach it a little bit differently than some manufacturers do. And by doing this, what we actually do is we increase the life, lifespan of our products. And, and this is in all of our extraction um, source capture, whether it's vehicle exhaust, weld smoke, any thermally generated fumes, anything of this by including ambient air, this reducing the temperature of the gases, thus prolonging the life of the products. So we're going to talk about product selection, airflow, hose diameter, and fan and duct sizing. And I need to move something here real quick on my chart. So looking at this, my apologies, looking at this, we approach this from, from simple cars, auto repair shops, dealership, things of that nature, all the way up to large military construction type equipment. We kind of stick with a nominal number. So we stick with a simple CFM based closely to the recommended hose diameter um, in our design feature. So for simple cars, you know, we're looking in the 250 to 300 CFM range. And we also look at the larger pickup trucks up to 400 CFM. So when we design a system or look at a system, say that's going in an automotive dealership repair facility, we kind of design closer to the 350 CFM range and we stick with the four or five inches hose, five inch hose sizes. The reason we do this is because of the larger airflow needed for some of the larger pickups. Now, if any of you have designed a, um, a vehicle repair facility for a dealership, they actually have certain zones for certain automobiles. So, one side of the shop's going to be basically just the cars. One side of the shop's going to be the diesel uh, pick -em up trucks, you know, the 250s, the 350s, et cetera. So we don't have to necessarily go five inch hoses across the entire shop. If we sit down at the front side and we know what's going on, we know what we're looking at, then we size accordingly. And this can be changed and, and altered throughout the system very simply or uh, through some other modifications. But as you can see, our hose temperature ranges there. We go from 600 or 300 on the on the car side all the way up to 1500 on the large uh, vehicles, military. I will say this, I have a project that, that Bob and I both worked on that just finished up in Portland, Oregon. In the 11th hour, they were already building the system, installing the duct work. The owner came to, to us in the engineering firm and said, hey, we got an issue. Buses are going into region while hooked up to the hose reels and we just melted one completely off the wall. When these buses go into region, the, the exhaust temperatures are in the 2000 to 3000 degree range. It is crazy. We ended up redesigning six bays of this metropolitan transit uh, facility and went from a regular six inch hose up to a, an eight inch hose in this application, but an extremely high CFM fan. We're pulling almost 1600 CFMs per hose through this system. And we have an, we have a, an agreement with them that within two minutes of the vehicle going into region, they must turn the vehicle off and they must disconnect the hoses. And they, and they do this now once they figured out what process causes a regen, so they're aware of it. 
but this is something that we had to kind of approach and and correct on the fly because we already had existing ductwork in the building that they couldn't change. Everything was kind of dynamic in it. So it was one of those situations where having the knowledge base that Netterman has and having the expertise in the product selection, we were able to address this as it went forward and solve the issue for everybody. So as you can see, we can go from cars, we can go to large military construction equipment, and you'll see various slides throughout this presentation. So here's a simple hose reel in a metropolitan bus facility. This one's actually up in New York City. Um, yeah, I get to say it that way. But here's an overhead uh, motorized reel. Um, this is a 1200 degree hose attached to the top of it. Now this is a standard type of bus connection right here. The new style is considered or called a Gillig and it's more of a rectangle. We suggest that when you use a Gillig nozzle because the nozzle is so much larger that you actually use a trolley or a cart for it to support it right at the back. I'm sure if you've been to Disney, you may have and rode on any of their buses. A lot of their buses are Gillig exhaust systems. They are Gillig buses. So it's just something that we have the versatility and we have the design uh, capabilities to work with all manufacturers across the board. Here's a nice uh, indication or a nice auto repair shop uh, with lifts on the left hand side there. You can see those are all uh, motorized hose reels and with simple exhaust connections. Those are great little products. In this application, they went ahead and did a fan with the reel. So they're all uh, individual exhaust ports. Instead of running you know, one major fan, they can turn these fans on and off as needed for these hose reels. As you can see, there's another, another product with a fan mounted directly to the hose reel at that, that bus repair facility. So that's again, a motorized hose reel. And that's one of our stainless steel with a built-in clamping mechanism. Uh, AKA vice grip for our tail, tailpipe adapters. We've, we've started a new practice at Nediman. This came about um, when Mike Murphy returned to the company. So what we're doing now is we're really sitting down instead of, instead of doing this, we're trying to get, make sure all of our boxes are checked and, and crossed off. So we have a very, very in-depth understanding of, of what you're really looking for, what you're designing, how can we help you, what are we seeing in the facility, all of these things. This, this is something that, like I mentioned on the bus barn, had we known about the region in advance, we could have approached that when the design firm was designing the process. As it was it came on the fly and we had to basically stop the project and and convert a lot of a, a lot of app app applications over pardon my uh my speech there here's a nice series of spring hose reels again these are also individual fans these can be pulled down by the technician um, and attached directly to the car there's a lot of benefit for using a a fan mounted a hose reel with a fan directly mounted as opposed to a large central fan um, simply because maybe you only need four of these hose reels on at one time and, and they're gonna vary left to right. We don't have to worry about a large fan and a large um, power draw. Although we do have that option, we do size accordingly. That's again, when we sit down with the groups, maybe we're putting 25 hose reels in a, in a service-based scenario. Do we really need to size the fan to cover 25 hose reels? If the, if the user is expanding their facility and they say, you know, not necessarily, maybe 15% or 18% of our cars are coming in for something that are non emissions related. So in other words, we do not have to run the vehicle. It's simply replacing a light bulb or it's an oil change, things they wouldn't necessarily connect the exhaust up to. We size the fan accordingly to work for those systems. So we're not running at you know, all hose reels at 100% capacity. That reduces costs, reduces operational costs, and it increases the uh, profitability for everybody. Talking about our spring hose reels, and, and I like these, and, and this is one thing you'll take away from this presentation. Hose reels are like toilet paper. It has to roll off the top. So we include a uh, hose stop on all of our spring hose reels with the hoses. That way you can't over curve and pull up and jam the nozzle up in the stop bar. 
We can adjust the uh, hose reel while it's in position. As you see there, there's a lot of different, um, different little bullet points. I'm not gonna read through all of them, but I'm gonna circle the one major place, if you can see my mouse. Right here is where we have the spring tensioning. So we can tension this in the field after the hose is installed. Here we go, talking about the spring tensioning right there. That is very, very simple. <clears throat> Allows a simple little adjustment while in the field. And the reason we have individual adjustability is we can put a hose, whether it's three inch, four inch, five inch, six inch, eight inch, that, that runs from 350 degrees Fahrenheit to 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. We generally don't put a 1200 degree Fahrenheit on a three inch hose reel. But if it calls, on, calls for that, we can do it. Now, each one of those hoses has a different weight rating per, per foot. So our spring tension has to be a little bit different uh, using a, a 1200 degree hose as compared to a 350 degree hose. We also have micro switch options for our spring hose reels, which enables it to open and close a damper. So, or turn on and off of a, uh, a fan system, ramp it up or down via VFD. And what ends up happening is, is we've got a set position in the hose reel design that once the hose extract, uh, retract, extends beyond a certain point or certain number of revolutions, it closes or opens the micro switch, sending the signal to either ramp the fan up or down according to whichever way the hose went. This is great system. We talked about a whole, a whole fan, whole, whole system design, put a VFD on there, ramp the fan up, ramp the fan down as needed, not excessive uh, electricity usage by having it all run at the same time. We also have an automatic damper system in there so that we can, after extending the hose down uh, one and a half, two revolutions, it opens the damper. This can simply turn on and off or, or change the pressure differential in the duct work and the VFD will sense this and move forward whether ramping up or ramping down. Our motorized hose reels, we see them generally in much larger hose, to, hose applications. So our, our six inch, our eight inch are more heavy duty. And that's in, that's in situations where they need to get the hose reel high above the floor so that the apparatus or vehicles can move in and out of the building. And they can use either a wired pendant or an infrared pendant to lower and um, retract the hose as needed. It also keeps it keeps that nozzle out of the uh, out of the walk zone or keep it in a better safe application so that it's not in anyone anyone's way. If you got a situation where maybe there's an overhead crane that may need to move back and forth, but you need the hose reels you put the hose reel above the overhead crane, it can transfer back and forth. Obviously, they would have to retract the hoses in that application. Talk about our, our motorized hose reels. It does not matter, this is the beauty of it, it, does not matter what our voltage system is for our fans or for anything else in the building. All of our motorized hose reels operate on a 110 volt uh, motor. So it's very, very low power usage. We don't have to have high power. We're not taking up extra space in the bus bar of the, uh, of the um, electrical system. Again, many of the same features as our spring hose reel, except for you don't have the adjustment with a uh, Allen wrench like you would on the spring. However, we still have roto molded um, plastic end caps. We still have hose guides. We still have drum shaft ball bearings. We still have, you know, the real frame size. Mounting both our 865 spring and our 865 M motorized hose reel is, are some of the easiest in, this, in the industry. Once the technician or installer installs the, the hanging frame, they simply slide the hose reel into place. Here's our up and down controllers. As I mentioned, we have the wired pendant and we have the wireless pendant. I will tell you this, the wireless pendant seems to find its way to people's toolboxes, lunch boxes in their house. Although we can't control that, the uh, wired pendant in our, in our opinion is probably the better way to go as far as not having them come up missing uh, <laughs> during the work day. We talk about the storage of our hose reels. So we have short drums and wide drums. And the reason we do this is maybe we have a lower height off the finished floor on a hose. So instead of just making one size to where we're gonna have excess space, four inch diameter hose, for instance, 
uh, it, we're putting a 24 foot length of hose. Well, there's no reason to put it on the wide drum. You'd have a lot of extra space there. It's just a design feature that we took into consideration based on what we've seen within the industry as far as mounting heights off of finished floors, things of that, that nature. This is a beautiful little application right here. Again, this is uh, direct mounted fans. This is actually a Harley Davidson repair facility. So in this instance, right here in the floor are the little bike lifts for, for working on their motorcycles. As you can see, there's three of them right there. I don't think we can see that other fan in proximity, but this is a great little system. This is simply a spring hose reel with the direct mount fan, and it's a straight do, uh, do building or do wall exhaust. I'm not a biggest fan of this short little duct design right here. However, I understand it because of fan placement in proximity to this rack of windows. We do understand that happens. Mounting, this is what I was talking about mounting. I, I kind of got a little ahead of myself. So once a technician installs these two mounting brackets for all of our 865 series hose reels, whether it's a wall mount, as you can see here in the center or on the upper right, a ceiling mount, once those brackets are in place, you always, you always install the hose or the hose reel without the hose, but it's very simple to just set it in its mount, place the four locking bolts in position, tighten them up, and then you coil the, the hose on it. This makes it very, very simple. It's a lower manpower install than a lot of the other brands out there. It's one of the nice design features with Netterman. And by using our rotomolded end plates, uh, we reduce the weight, although we have not reduced any longevity of the product. We still have these in the field under constant duty, um, unless it's an extreme high heat, like the bus barn that melted it off the wall with 3000 degrees, these guys even roto molded last a lifetime. As you can see here, we have various options. So I'm actually, uh, one of the Veritech uh, staff contacted me yesterday for an application on military base where they're actually going to be testing generators. So although I propose just a simple little single drop, as you can see here, this is our boom arm with the hose reel. Now, once we use the boom arm or we use our track, we have to go with a spring hose reel. We don't have the ability to powerize the rail. Um, we could powerize the, the boom, but then you get into a lot of money and it's just not worth it in this application. So we can extend it out to where we need to. Maybe they place these generators or engines in various locations and we're, we're, we're technicians working on the back one right now. And two hours later, they move over here to this newer yellow one, it's vice versa, however they do it. We can articulate and flex. As you can see, we put the fan at the top of the uh, wall right there with a discharge. Uh, duck work. On the right hand side of the screen there you can see that is our reel on rail. So that's a trolley system right here that runs along our 250 ALU rail system. We can run that for hundreds of feet. Now this, this sizing and this um, design becomes critical. Anytime we use our rail systems we have a pair of rubber lips that basically close. In the industry, this might be referred to as a zipper duct. The torpedo, as we like to call it, or the trolley, just off the side of the rail, I'm trying to find my mouse here, here we go, right there. We cannot oversize the fans in these applications with too much static. Otherwise, you would not be able to pull the reel down the rail and move it to new applications without turning the fan off. So once we design in these systems, we take into very, very serious consideration all of our static calculations to make sure that we're not putting a fan on with, with say eight inches of static uh, and we really only need four and a half, five inches of static. So that's something we just sit down and talk with everybody involved in the project about. Here's a couple of options right here. So again, as I mentioned, this lower left-hand corner, that's a reel on rail. However, as you can see on the center and on the far right, I can also use just my trolley system with a single drop balancer and that can slide along as a as an automobile is being run through manufacturing and production. Maybe they're doing the first engine startup testing in the uh, assembly line, things of that nature. So we have a lot of versatility right there from traveling to stationary capture. 
One of our newest features, and this, is, this was developed in Europe, as you can see by the tailpipes, but they're gaining popularity here in North America. We call it our touchless system. So basically, I like to refer to it or describe it, as you can see right there between C and D, is if I have my hand facing up and I kind of cup it like I'm trying to hold a little bit of water, that is my source capture point. As you can see on these two automobiles, the, uh, the capture point is right underneath at the bottom of the bumper. So this is on a trolley or a rail system as we discussed. So this is moving. We generally put these in a moving application where they're gonna move the exhaust. One of the design criteria that brought this product to market is Volkswagen has a small coupe where the exhaust pipes actually terminate in front of or just behind the rear axle. The two tailpipes at the back of the car are just for a facade, just to look good. And they did that for both an emissions and a sound issue. So they came to us looking for an ability or a way to capture the exhaust for these, these Volkswagens with the exhaust being underneath the car. And that's what brought this, this touchless system into play. As you can see in this slide, I can extend 16 and a half feet so I can mount my rail fairly high off the situation off the floor. Um, as I as you can see there, I articulate. So as you bend your elbow, as you cup your hand and rotate your hand, I can do all of those features with with my cup and with my articulation joint. And again, it's on a balancer situ situation, to, so it's easy up and down, uh, very easy to manipulate inside the facility. Here you can see it's fully, fully uh, collapsed on the left-hand side and, and it's in a reach out position on the right-hand side. We spoke of, we spoke of the rail on the um, trolley or on the extension boom a few minutes ago, but here's an application where we put a simple balancer drop on an extension boom. This can get us up to 20 feet off the wall. So in this application, Here's some here's some nice generators being repaired. This is this is a military application. We are running high heat. One of our stainless steel nozzles. Uh, we have stainless duct packages available. All high heat. So we don't just high heat the the first portion of the hoses. Knowing the application and knowing what we're going to do, we actually high heat hose all of the articulation and flexing joints. So this gives us a lot of flexibility for custom designing what we need in the field. Um, for per any given application. As I spoke about a uh, single drop, this is a simple single drop. It's in a fixed position. It's a balancer system. Um, a lot of times we will put these in high schools for their, for their auto repair shops. Um, positions. Now you do not move this so it's in it's in one fixed position. You can do it both with individual fans. You can do it both with single uh, single fans. As you can see here, this is a a picture of a of a not so proper install. And this is a hard 90, basically. You're hanging the flex hose off the fan. This fan could have actually been rotated um, 90 degrees down with the motor pointing up and you wouldn't have had any restrictions. As we know, flex hoses does have restrictions, but we kind of go about that in a different way or cover that in a different way. Let me move this over my screen here. So this is our five classifications of hoses. So this is our, our crush proof. The NRCP is crush proof all the way up to the NFC 10. As you can see, we go 350F to 2000F um, on this. Now each one is, is got a different characteristic. So as you can see there, we might be rubber with a nylon helix that's crush resistant. Um, cloth with an external steel or cloth with external, you know, all cloth with external steel. In our 1.5, as you can see there, it does have a coating. So we make sure that in the event the hose touches the side of the vehicle, um, it does not provide or cause any scratching. When we get into the 4.2, the 6.5 and the 10, that's in generally in a commercial application. So your dump trucks, your, your um, Metro Transit buses, and even up into your military applications for tanks and things of that nature. And as you can see, we go in different uh, uh, inch diameter ranges there. So as we talked about, or as, as I mentioned on static pressure and what we see with hoses, 
a lot of times a general a general flex hose is going to have the internal ribs this is just a massive amount of static that you that you're going to have to overcome with with oversizing fans and in higher u power usage we put our helix on the outside of the hose that ensures that we have more of a smooth internal much more like a uh, hard duct line it also helps us produce a coating or a protective coating on the exterior to make sure that we don't cause any harm to the vehicles. Even on our higher helix, our higher heat hoses, you can see it's always an external helix. So we have a much more smooth uh, internal surfaces, reducing the amount of static that can build up. Here's a beautiful tank application. Now, one thing we talked about, or I mentioned going early, starting in the front side was the introduction of ambient air. So we can reduce the operating temperature of exhaust gases by 40% within the first 10 feet of hose. And the reason that that's important is this section right here might be 2000 degree hose. However, because this is on a system, a spring hose reel, if we were to continue all the way to the top of that hose reel with 2000 degree hose, A, given its diameter, it's not gonna wanna coil real well. And B, we wouldn't be able to put that on a spring hose reel. We'd have to go to a heavy duty motorized hose reel. In this application, the, the client, the government requested spring hose reels. So we blended two pieces of hose to, because we've dropped from say 1200 right here, we've dropped it by 40%. So that puts us closer to, to what, about 800 degrees in here, 600 degrees. My math might be a little bit off, but it's within the normal parameters of our hoses, our hose ratings in this application. We have a plethora of nozzles. Um, this is one of the lines It doesn't matter what we're working on. We have some of the best nozzles in the world. We actually have a um, internal bayonet style touchless nozzle. It's, it's similar to the touchless system, but this nozzle itself, the bayonet extends into the vehicle's tailpipe. And as you squeeze the blue handle, it expands. This soft rubber facing can be rotated. So it doesn't matter if it's a left or a right hand side uh, tailpipe. We virtually every, well, I say, shouldn't say every car, but most manufacturers now have their tailpipes embedded in a painted bumper. This enables us to extend into the tailpipe, ratchet it up or down to remove it. We don't touch it. We're still close enough. We're introducing ambient air. We're still cooling the system. The, we only offer this currently in the four inch design because this is primarily strictly an automotive prop. We no longer have to stick a, a suction cup on the bumper and try to hold a nozzle in place, things of that nature. But we also have a variety of locking nozzles as you can see here um, from round to oval to triangular. So we have an entire selection of nozzles um, some of the highest in the industry. And again, over here on the right hand side, if we're in a commercial application, say with a um, either a diesel bus or a small diesel uh, dump truck where we have a high exhaust, we have that capacity right there with just being able to technician can set it right up on top of their their apparatus or cars. Here's the internal grip nozzle that I mentioned. So this is an embedded uh, tailpipe scenario on the back of this BMW. Um, this is a patented product. It extends right into that tailpipe, not touching any of the paint surfaces. So we will not scratch or harm any of the pipes or any of the car's finishes. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful product. As you can see, here's even a, a Buick, that's a Buick with, a, um, with an internal tailpipe. So it's not just the high-end cars, it's, it's almost every manufacturer out there. Talking about the commercial application of nozzles, when we get into the heavier equipment, you'll see me and Bob both specify stainless steel nozzles. We have that in six, eight, five, six, and eight inch di diameter hoses and up to 12 inch diameter on the opening. The locking clamp, and, and this isn't a commercial application, we're, not, we're talking like military vehicles or generator connections, things of that nature. That is simply a modified vice grip that connects and holds that, that nozzle in place. So let's start talking about duct design here for a second, because we've talked a lot about products and I've kind of pointed out some do's and don'ts, but I wanna really talk about this real quick and go into some detail here. 
So depending upon what we're capturing, whether it's simple vapors or gas or heavy moist oils, we design around duct velocity. We talk about transfer velocity more than we talk about anything else. So as you can see in our application right here, we could consider this somewhere between vapors and gas and welding fumes. I primarily myself design in the 2,500 feet per minute range simply to overcome any mechanical um, obstructions that the installers might put in my way of adding additional 90s and things of that nature. So sometimes you may say, John, your duct sizing is a little fast, a little hot. Well, I've seen real world applications where it was a straight line duct, but they ended up putting 1490s in it because they wanted to hold it closer to a wall. So I kind of designed myself around that applications. Here's a great indication of what we look at. So when we're coming in with transitions, and I and I know everybody here probably has talked about, thought about, or, or you know, heard something about a transition. I liken it to getting on the highway. I hate seeing 90s coming into a duck line because that's like trying to go from a dead stop onto a major freeway at a 90 degree angle. That never works real well. We end up having an accident. So we always come at it, try to come into it with a 30 degree Y transition. We're trying to bring our air in constantly in the uh, transition style that is increasing. So we're not stacking it in past the transition. It just helps greatly with airflow. And if you if you have issues or re questions regarding duct sizing, please feel free to reach out to Bob or myself and we can help you with sizing uh, both in diameters and then show you the feet per minute and show you the calculations. This is how we like to approach it. This is one of the most applicable ways. And it wouldn't matter in this instance whether this was a hose reel, a single balancer drop, et cetera. It's, it's just the bringing in and transferring of air. I spoke to you a little bit about frequency drives. Um, we have uh, Vicon frequency drives we use exclusively. <clears throat> when we use these with our systems, they are programmed and set up at the, at the office in Charlotte before they are sent to the job site based off of information that yourselves have provided us and we have provided the office with the order. So we know where the set points are. We know what the minimals are. We know what we're working in, it with and we're not having to get it in the field and an electrician spending hours and upon hours trying to figure out how they set up the VFD. Here's a typical application for VFDs in a uh, duck rail on our hose rail system. So again, this could be simple hose reels, it could be simple drops, it can be things of that nature. But through a pressure transducer and, and VFD, we can ramp up, we can ramp down. It's a, a great power saving to, uh, benefit. And again, it, we can offer assistance in duct sizing and duct design. Personally, this is just for illustrations. This is the biggest no-no in the duct world, um, in my opinion. But given what we had to draw with there, that's pretty much what we could get. Talk about duct pressures and diameters. So depending upon what we're looking at, what our system is, we have minimal uh, gauge requirements. So depending on what our diameter, and what our water gauge is, we can definitely make recommendations right there for you. Keep in mind, anytime you're pulling air versus pushing air, uh, you can get away with a lot thinner duct wall in HVAC by comparison to um, source capture extraction. You definitely have to think about the duct gauging in this. You don't have to always go into special uh, stainless steel applications. Majority of the times, galvanize a perfectly acceptable uh, for vehicle exhaust. Some people want stainless and that's a wonderful thing and we appreciate people looking at it that way. However, it's not a requirement. Sometimes we get asked the questions about what should we do, weather cap, no loss stack, things of this nature on our, on our fan discharges. The weather cap actually will induce um, additional static and cause restrictions as opposed to the no loss stack head. So if given the options, I always go with the no loss stack. And granted, I don't believe um, for this group, we, we really designed for ex you know, extreme weather conditions. Uh, snow loads and things of that nature. So very, very simple approach is just with a no loss stack head. Uh, duct design, preferred and avoidable. So anytime we can go with a long radius 
um, that's a preferred method. The short radiuses are the hard 90s, such as you see on the far right hand side. That's where we run into problems. In fluid or air dynamics, and this is a situation here with the avoid, once this air starts to turn, it will actually start to spin inside this ductwork and start becoming turbulent. And what that eventually does is it eventually causes a backup in the, in the source capture. So this is a major headache. And we see this where you may have designed a system with the long radiuses. We get called out to the job because the job is not working properly. And we see all these hard 90 uh, ductwork connections. And that's really where the problem comes into play. That's why you'll, we talked about a little bit ago, additional static to try to overcome design flaws or not, I shouldn't say design flaws, but install flaws. Things to avoid on branches. So as I mentioned, uh, we saw that, that the one with the simple VFD, we like the 30 to 60 Y transition branch or a 30 to 60 short transition branch, hard 90s. I don't think anybody likes driving onto the highway from a dead stop at a T. Mentioned in the transitions, I like my 30 degrees to, to be branched into my reduction to ex expansion size. I prefer, you know, it, that's my preferred. If design feature says I have to go into the, uh, to the next duct size, I will. Um, but I do try to not do that myself. Again, avoid the hard 90s. If we have multiple branches coming in in transition and in duct size changing, let's try not to put them right beside each other. Let's try to stagger them to some degree and avoid uh, the branches right, right across from each other. Again, as the air flows in right here, we basically have a, 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 connect, a collision in this point causing turbulence, which will slow down the airflow inbound. Fan selections. So when we start talking about fans, we always talk about pressure, static, and things of that nature. So our hose reels pretty much have roughly four inches of static built into them. It's, it's the calculations a little bit less, but with the hose retract or hose fully coiled, um, the transitions in the hose reels and things of that. This is just the nature of the business. As you can see here, we have charts and, and design features for all sizes. So from three inch at 33 feet, all the way to six inch at 16 feet. So as you can follow across at roughly 300 CFM, we can be at six inches of static. Uh, let's see, 300 CFM. No, we're actually going to be higher. We're going to be at eight inches ballpark. I'm trying to read that scale. So we we take this into consideration with fan sizing, with duct calculations, and things of that nature. Very very important. I see a lot of jobs where someone has specced in a a brand of fan that's known for kitchen exhaust at at an inch and a half of static, and you just can't do much around an inch and a half of static. On our fan selections, we try to stay within the realm of the fan curve. We want to design for kind of the midpoint. So in this application, if I'm looking for 2000 CFM at five inches of static, this NFC 3015 is going to be my go-to. I'm not going to place this fan anywhere where I may only need a thousand CFM and in, in higher static because I'm at a flat point on that curve and it's just not going to be optimal for airflow. That is the conclusion of the presentation. So I'd like to open the floor to questions if anyone has any. We do have one question in the chat. Okay. Uh, is there a code issue of having a positive pressure hazardous exhaust duct off the real mounted exhaust fan, such as shown on the motorcycle shop and dealer repair facility? Well, that's a good question that I'm going to defer to Mr. Hotchkiss for. Yeah, can you read that again, please? Yeah. Is there a code? Is there a, a uh, is there a code issue of having a positive pressure hazardous exhaust duct off the real mounted exhaust fan, such as shown on the motorcycle shop and dealer repair facility? Okay. Um, I'm going to answer it and hopefully I'm going to answer this question. So, or their question. 
so basically you're you're sucking from the nozzle of the hose that's hanging down there it's getting sucked through the hose that's wound up on the hose reel and then it, he's uh, that person is right there's a positive pressure going out the duct um in terms of code there is nothing that says you can't ventilate vehicle exhaust to the atmosphere okay it's just like running your car outside on the road or your motorcycle outside on the road it's the same thing you're just ventilating to atmosphere so it's 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 the preferred method it's it's legal it's ethical it's not dangerous it is uh, no more dangerous than um, just running your vehicle outside now Hopefully i will offer I will offer one more one more uh, thing to that for Mr. Hotchkiss. Anytime you exhaust any sort of gases, you must be cognizant of fresh air intakes. So even though we see this over a bank of windows, these windows are not necessarily opening. This facility is actually in Canada, so or this repair shop's in Canada. So these ve these windows are. Maybe this lower one is, a, is an openable window, but the rest of these panes are not openable. So you do have code restrictions as far as exhausting in proximity of fresh air intake. Yeah, you don't, in other words, you don't want to exhaust outside next to something that's going to bring it right back inside, kind of defeats yeah. the purpose, right? <laughs> so you just exhaust it out, make sure it's not near an air conditioning unit or an open window or something like that. Um, Bob, if you had, uh, not Bob Hotchkiss, Bob Dietz, if you had any follow-up questions to that, you can go ahead and ask it as well. Um, and then we do have another question. Do vehicle exhaust fans come with a variable speed controller? That would be an accessory. Oh, I'm sorry, John. Yes. I jumped on. No, 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 um, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no, the, the fans are, uh, are provided with just a, a motor and, uh, Anything outside of that would be an accessory. So if they just want a simple on-off motor starter, that is something that we would offer. If they want a variable frequency drive for a lot more control with a, uh, a large system, that would just be an accessory. The motors are capable of being attached to a VFD, but the motors themselves aren't inherently variable, variable frequency drive. Okay. Um, now, one thing about our motors is you'll see, let me see if I can find a better picture here. We do have um, voltage ranges. Now, I don't have a picture of it, but we do have voltage ranges. So sometimes we'll have a, a 230 and a 460 will be the same same motor on a fan. So. Correct. Yeah, so, so the, 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 the motors are either multi-voltage in three phase, so 28, 230, 460 here domestically or single phase 115. And we can get a single phase 208, but that's very, very uncommon. Yeah. And then we just have to match the motor starter with the voltage or the, the VFD with the voltage. All right, that and is we can do we can do fans over up to and over 100 horsepower. So that's that's one of our we manufacture a lot of our own fans and we also are in partnership with one of, one of the world's largest fan manufacturers. So it depends upon which fan we're running, whether it's a large NCF fan such as you see here or I will go back real quick. The fans you see on this hose reel, this is just what we call an N series fan. We manufacture literally thousands of these fans um, yearly. It, it's goes with probably 50% of our source capture products, whether it's extraction arms, vehicle exhaust, uh, pharma, or pharmaceutical laboratory exhaust, things of that nature. So, uh, Kelly, can you just ask Bob who asked that first question if, if that answer was what he was looking for? Yeah, um, Bob, if it wasn't, you can come off mute and clarify. <laughs> <laughs> and in the meantime, we do have another question from Justin. What is the recommended exhaust rate for motorcycles? Exhaust rate for motorcycles is going to be in the 300, 350 CFM range. Their displacement is so small. Um, generally, you're looking at a two, two cycle or 
two cylinder, or even on some of your larger, you might be looking at a four cylinder, even a V8 engine in an automobile is still in the 350 CFM range. All right. And they actually, while we're, while we're talking about motorcycles, um, there's a couple of, of dealerships because of um, their exhaust pipes, the way they kind of flare out and that we can roll this cup like, like you can roll your hand. They've actually got the touchless system and a couple other motorcycle repair facilities because they can come right up to those chrome exhaust pipes and capture it without touching it. And if you own a motorcycle yeah, and that's your little baby, you know you don't want that chrome touched by anything. So for small cars, we're doing typically 250 to 300. If you think a motorcycle, which is half the displacement, is the same rate as, a, as, a, as an automobile? Well, it's not that it's the same rate as the automobile. It's just that's the smallest we basically design around. Um, you'd be talking things in the two-inch duck type world. So it's, it's really just better to stick with the minimum in the, in the 300, 350 CFM range due to fan sizing. You still can run a 115 volt fan at 300 CFM at four or five inches of static, no problem. It's, it's your common duck sizes that's gonna run more of an issue when you start having to buy specialty duck in the two to you know, two inch lines and things of that nature. Let me, so let, finding, me, let me jump we in here. Really we would typically see three inch duct systems and you mentioned that a couple of times, but it wasn't showing up in any of your charts. Do you guys not have a, have a standard three inch product? We have three inch hoses. We're, we, we do, we personally, Netterman does not manufacture duct work. We do have a sister company, Nordfab that manufactures clamp together duct work. And that fits in, that fits in their category. Correct. But you, but you have a three inch drop that you could bring down to a motorcycle. Yes. And yeah. you'd still do that three inch at the at the three hundred to three fifty. I mean, that would I would be because it's close to three thousand. Yeah, velocity is going to be yes. You're right. Velocity is going to be high. However, it's a standard core product that we can offer. That's that's not going to cost the end user extra money. If we go to trying to source smaller fans and get just right down to the say one hundred and fifty cfm or one seventy five two hundred ballpark then the cost actually will go up for the consumer or the end user. I guess, I guess the dovetail on that is there's, you know, these, all these hose reels work within a range of CFMs, right? So we would, we would design the same hose reel for passenger vehicles as we would with the, with the motorcycles, even though the actual, Displacement of the engine is much smaller. You'd still use the same uh, tools to extract. Uh, when you start getting down into, you know, two and three inch hoses, you start running into other issues with engineering static pressures increase and things like that too. So the, the engineering gets goofy. And like John would said, when you start getting outside of the core product, prices actually tend to go up. So, you, can, you can go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, kind of more of a code issue, which you guys may or may not know. So in the mechanical code, any automotive repair, motorcycle repair, whatever is required to have 0.75 CFM per square foot of exhaust. Um, are you generally finding that consulting engineers are using your system for that 0.75? You know, obviously we wouldn't put a VFD drive on it, just letting it run all the time. Or are you kind of seeing your systems as standalone source capture and then they're doing a totally separate exhaust system down the wall or whatever to handle that 0.75? The, so is that, is it, that, just let me clarify real quick. Is that 0.75, I have never heard this code before. Is that 0.75 just uh, general ventilation or is that, are, are they applying that to actual exhaust? Vehicle so exhaust? what the International Mechanical Code states and it's based on occupancy, if you, if you have, and it just says automotive repairs, um, it states that you, anytime the, the space is occupied, you have to have continuous exhaust of 0.75 CFM per square foot. Got so it. if you have a thousand square foot repair shop, you need, and there's somebody in there, one person, you have to be exhausting um, 750 CFM. I'm just curious if, are people using your system counting towards that? Or is your system kind of a standalone system that would be an addition to that? And then they're putting in a separate exhaust system. Because in, in none of those pictures I'm seeing that you're showing in any of the shops I've been to, I'm not seeing a separate exhaust system for that 
rates. I'm wondering if they're just using your system to count towards that, or, or you guys don't necessarily know how they're permitting. Yeah, it. I'll, I'll jump in here, and John, you can give your opinion too. I yeah. I've never run into that code before. Uh, when when we're discussing vehicle exhaust e extraction, uh, we're more concerned with what's going on in the tailpipe and getting those fumes out, and not not the um, general exhaust system within the building. So uh, I, I don't know if, if engineers are, are designing our exhaust system into that code. Um, I've just never run into it. I've always designed our system as completely independent as is what, it, what the requirement is just to get that exhaust out. And John, you can jump in there and, and give your experience. Yeah, I've actually seen here in the last few months, um, more engineering firms are adding a secondary. So ours is an independent system, but they're adding a secondary exhaust system that, that's tied in with the HVAC. Now, every, every auto dealership that I've been to or seen in action, they have auto door sensors. So every time that a vehicle exits or enters, you have the door is up and down. So that's again, that's an induction of fresh air. However, I do see our system is standalone and they've started adding secondary exhaust systems tied into the, to the MAUs and the HVA system, HVAC systems. But so, yeah, I guess, I guess at the end of the day, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of, they're using it in conjunction, not necessarily us as a standalone. Now in the fire station world, our EMST products, because that, that's a always one fan, I shouldn't say always, that's 99.9% .9 of the time, one fan, multiple drops, whether it's three drops or eight drops on the average, you know, fire stations. With the ambient collection, say strictly one vehicle powers up and exits, the, the rest of the, the vehicle's capture points are actually acting as secondary air extraction. So in that particular one, because it's either all on or all off, it does work as secondary. That cleared up? He went back on mute. <laughs> ah. Well, hopefully um. we cleared it up. <laughs> and, and, and one thing, codes, and we run into this in, in all sorts of, of things. And, you know, with Bob's region over in California and Arizona, and mine in New Mexico, Texas, and Louisiana, there's a different approach by each state and what happens. So California obviously has a lot more restrictions and, and codes written in for uh, capturing exhausting gases where Texas, I hate to say it, is still kind of, hey, open the garage door at an auto repair shop. I mean, it's it's factual. I'm not, you know, I'm not dismissing anything. It's just, it's a more temperate climate. I shouldn't say more temperate climate, but they're just more accustomed to opening the door and letting the exhaust filter out naturally. I don't agree with it because I can't sell them a system there. <laughs> just, just to clarify, what we're talking about is the International Mechanical Code. It's adopted in every single state you guys sell in, and it has been for 30 years. I, I don't. California. Yeah. They, and, they require it too. It, it's not. And yeah. It's not anything going to be unique per city or state. I mean, it's in the no, no, no. It, the main international code. And and we we definitely understand your question. I'm just what I'm stating is, I have just now seen it on a few sets of plans where they added a secondary exhaust system that's capturing the ambient air and not using ours as the total source capture for all the air in the facility. Okay, thank you. I think, I don't okay. think we had any more questions. <laughs> all right, now I will are... say this, we, we have yeah. seen, hang on a real second Kelly. We have seen a, a, a huge push for air monitoring systems inside the facilities with, with CO2 sensors tied into the MAUs and things of this nature. So maybe they're adopting it a little bit more. I, I couldn't tell you what all, all the engineering firms out there do. I only can tell you what I've seen come across my desk for, for plan and spec. Okay, understood. Thanks guys, appreciate it. Hey, thank you. We appreciate the questions. Yeah, that was great. Um, and there are a couple more. So Bob did um, respond and he said that he's always had the understanding that any hazardous duct work inside occupied space needs to be a negative pressure duct. Uh, so is there a seal class that the duct needs to be installed to? Since it's positive mm. pressure. 
you know, there. Go ahead, Bob. If you've got this. No, no, I, I, I just have never run into that. So I, yeah. If, yeah. if that does exist, I've I've never heard of it. In we like dozens of years of experience, I've never had an issue running duct positive pressure to the outside. Yeah, I mean, I I see simp simple yeah. duct work as far as. Uh, spiral duct work that's zip screwed together and then, then is mastic. All the joints are mastic. And then I see other groups that go to the, to the extent of going with clamp together ducting with nitrile or silicone seals in between each joint. So that's what I've seen. Um, you know. Okay. And then one more question in the chat from Salah. What's the airflow when using a Y connection with dual outlets for a single hose reel? You're so still going to, to the, I was thinking maybe the motorcycle question that was probably, I think that's when that question came in. Well, in a single drop, we can put a dual tailpipe exhaust adapter on, on a single drop. Depending upon, and it's really the same CFM rating, whether it's coming through a single tailpipe or it's coming through dual tailpipes. So if it's, for instance, a, a Chevrolet 350, 350 cubic inch displacement, whether they're running on duals or singles, it's still only 350 cubic inches of displacement. So we're gonna design around a 350 CFM system um, because it's not, you're not adding a second generation point. You're simply splitting the exhaust into two. If, is, am I answering your question there? Uh, so off you wanted to, oh, yep, yes. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. Um, that is it for the questions in the chat. If anybody wants to come off mute and ask any others, um, otherwise we can wrap it up. Nobody? Nobody. Well, again, everyone who's still online, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for taking the time out of your day. Um, to participate and attend the, the vehicle exhaust webinar. Um, we are doing other webinars through Netterman that pertain to different things. I will let Kelly know what's going on there. So if you have any interest in fire stations or you design around fire stations, we'd love for you to attend those. If you design around industrial applications, uh, we have various webinars that we look at and do there. So I, I'll share everything with Kelly and Kelly can share with the group. Absolutely. And actually, in the last couple of email blasts that I've sent out, I have included, um, I think, two others of yours. So nice, nice. Yeah, nice. Just keep Good sending deal. to me and I'll keep sharing them. We'll keep doing them. Thank you all, everybody. Awesome. Thank you so much, John and Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all have a wonderful have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you. you.